Episode 16, Lovely But Lethal, first aired September 23rd, 1973. It was written by Jackson Gillis, who we know very well from his previous writing for Suitable for Framing, Short Fuse, Dagger of the Mind, Requiem for a Falling Star, The Most Dangerous Match, and Double Shock. There's a second writing credit from Myrna Brkovici. I couldn't find a picture of her to show you, and the only other credit to her name is for the book she wrote called Prophecy, an interpretation about the end of the earth. And it was directed by Jeannot Swack, born 1939 in Paris, France. He directed several episodes of Night Gallery, Kojak, The Practice, Jag, Without a Trace, Smallville, Bones, and Grey's Anatomy. We have a new producer now, Douglas Benton, the writer and producer of Heck Ramsey. Dean Hargrove, the producer for all of season two, wanted to move on from Columbo. Our season three opening episode begins very strangely, and I might even use the word awkwardly, with a lady's face and a man hovering over her with his mouth hanging open and his hands weirdly closing in on her to poke her cheeks. Then a camera gets shoved into her face, and another super close and awkward view of this man now holding a scalpel, mouth still open, and he gathers some scrapings from her cheek this time, and looking like he hasn't eaten in weeks. Then he applies the scraping to a slide while continuing to lean over the woman's face. Another man in the room says, next victim please, as this mouth gaping white coated man wrings his hands together like a mad scientist. This room we are filming in is the same room as a stitching crimes operating room. Oh shut up Carl, take courage sir. Just think how many years Dr. Frankenstein must have spent on his research. Supposedly, this line referencing Frankenstein gave producer Benton the idea to have this entire episode pay homage to the Universal Monster movies. Let's see how well this idea shines through as we watch. Although I guess his choice in director is our first hint at the theme. Being a horror film veteran with a few other works I didn't mention like Night of Terror, The Devil's Daughter, Bug, Jaws 2, and The Murders in the Rue Morgue. And the music is composed by Dick de Benedictus. He was specifically instructed by Benton to compose an eerie score. So the spooky scientist man is named Dr. Murchison, played by Fred Draper, born 1923 in Chester, Pennsylvania. And we already know him from his previous appearance as the cab driver in Lady in Waiting. Now remember, I do not repeat actors' resumes every time they show up in an episode. You love to tell me how disappointed you are that I completely skipped so-and-so's credits, but I didn't. Go back to their first Columbo appearance, which I always share with you what it is. Anyway, now that Dr. Murchison is going to take a second scraping, he suddenly has never held a scalpel before and is so shaky that he nicks the poor woman's cheek. I'm not sure what happened between now and the 20 seconds earlier when your hands were steady, but the young doctor steps in and giving him a pat on the shoulder and takes over. By the way, if you notice while this strange scene takes place, every time you see Dr. Murchison, he has gloves on, but when we see the lady's face, he is no longer wearing gloves. Well, Dr. Murchison leaves the operating room or whatever and enters his office all hunched over and violently tears off one of his gloves. Sitting at his desk, he takes out of the drawer of essential supplies a bottle of Valley Tavern whiskey to calm himself. Then he glances over to a little red jar and shakily reaches for it, saying, A miracle. That's all I want. That's all we've ever wanted. Right, Your Majesty? Scene changed to a fluffy collared turban woman observing a fashion show. This one flowing and soft in a soft print and with its sparkle and glamour. The fashion show moderator is played by Lane Mathis. This moment is her one and only acting credit. Vivica, darling, what are you doing here? Settling false eyelashes, huh? Whoa, Vincent Price? Oh, wow. Well, this is exciting. Vincent Price was born 1911 in St. Louis, Missouri. He began his career on stage and radio, very successful in both. But if you know his name, then you likely know him from his many starring roles in horror films. That means having Vincent Price in this episode is another checkmark for Benton's goal of having this episode shrouded in horror. Vincent Price had a very full acting career. Some of his film essentials are House of Wax, The Fly, House on Haunted Hill, The Abominable Dr. Fibes, Last Man on Earth, Witchfinder General, The Tingler, Theater of Blood, and the entire Edgar Allan Poe series, which includes Tales of Terror, The Haunted Palace, The Mask of the Red Death, The Tomb of Lygia, 
The Raven, The Pit and the Pendulum, and House of Usher. You might also recognize him as Egghead in the Batman TV series, and appearing in several episodes of the Red Skelton Hour, as well as the narrator for every episode of the hilarious House of Frightenstein, and famously the voice for Michael Jackson's Thriller. His final film role was the inventor in Edward Scissorhands. I suppose you all know how to use one of these things, but in case you don't, you just press down on this lever with your thumb and then pull the trigger. You see, they're loaded. Boy, I can't wait to see how his character, David Lang, plays out in this episode of Columbo. I wonder who he will murder. Probably the turban lady. David Lowe, where did you get the new hairpiece? Surely you don't make anything that clever. Oh. <laughs> Still my lover, huh? These two do a little bit of friendly bantering with each other about how each of the other's cosmetic business is doing poorly and that someday one or the other is going to end up working for the other. Hopefully that sentence made sense. But if things do get too bad, if you ever do need to get out of this crazy roller coaster business. Oh, David. Are you in for a surprise? The little tune playing in the background is Girl from Ipanema. It's a Brazilian bossa nova and jazz song that became a worldwide hit in the 1960s. This piece can be heard in so many movie and television productions. Oftentimes it is used during an elevator scene or quietly in the background of a party or gathering. Can you share a reference where it is played? Anyway, David Lang introduces his secretary here. What a sweet little dress. Don't waste your ammunition, honey. My secretary, that's all Shirley Blaine. I think you dropped your program. Oh yes, how silly of me, of course I did. And we see she did not drop her program. This woman is named Vivica Scott, played by Vera Miles, born 1929 in Boise City, Oklahoma. She's probably best known for her role in Psycho as the sister of Janet Lee's character, but she was also in The Man Who Shot Liberty Valance, The Fugitive, and Psycho 2. Look, if you two are in this thing together, I don't care. It's none of my business. But I want to talk to Marion, and I want her to tell me it's none of my business, and then I'll go... So Vivica says she'll send flowers to David's funeral and leaves. Scene changed to a man presenting some concept boards to Vivica. And then suddenly Vivica realizes how much she likes the sun. The sun. I love the sun. So these boards are design and name ideas for a new formula that Vivica's company called Beauty Mark is about to produce. Imagine a harmless cream that can actually make wrinkles disappear. It's what women have longed for since ancient Egypt. Then, stumbling into the room, is Dr. Murchison after finishing off his Valley Tavern bottle. Vivica is surprisingly excited to see him despite his condition. Come in. We were just talking. Yes, yes. The fruits of a whole year's labor. The dream to save all our skins. He says he performed a secret testing of the elixir, he calls it, and that makes Vivica very upset because she never gave him permission to do any more testing. She's worried one of the models will gossip about what they've been working on. Oh yeah, and before we forget, this man is named Jerry, and he is played by Colby Chester, born 1941 in Greenwich, Connecticut. He was in 129 episodes of The Young and the Restless. Murchison reveals some devastating news. It was a fluke. One little sample that broke down. I tried combination after combination since. Now we are outside restaurant, which I suppose is a restaurant. They serve cocktails there, if I'm not mistaken. But then I get confused by what we see next because it sure doesn't look like a restaurant. I got your note on the back of the program, dear, but I really haven't time to talk right now. Maybe we're in one of those overly fancy bathrooms or powder rooms. Why in the world would they meet here, though? Anyway, we learn this girl, Shirley, is Vivica's pipeline to the goings-on of David Lang and his business. What have you made a photocopy of now? A check. I'm happy that David Lang has $200,000 to give anyone. Who's Harry Smith, his bookie? No, that's not his real name. Turns out this Mr. Smith has a formula he is trying to sell to David Lang, and Shirley witnessed them test it on the skin of an older friend of Shirley's she was asked to bring in. Then, instead of finishing her story, she she grabs an elderly maid walking by. Oh, sweetheart, you've got a smudge right there by your eye. I do? Yes, but I'll, I'll rub it off for you. Here, oh. come sit down. Yeah, this is pretty standard practice when someone alerts you to a smudge on your face. 
We sit down and wait for them to remove the smudge for us. Now uh, close your eyes. Oh yeah, we also close our eyes. Shirley rubs some of the formula on this lady's face that she swiped from the meeting David Lang and Harry Smith had together the other day. We watch in anticipation. Thank you, ma'am. Well, I guess some of her wrinkles smoothed out, sort of. But this very trusting cleaning lady is played by Virginia Sale, born 1899 in Urbana, Illinois. She was in a couple episodes of The Andy Griffith Show and Petticoat Junction. Wrinkles just disappear and it lasts all day. Shirley, what does Harry Smith look like? He's about medium height, thick brown hair, not more than 35 years old. Well, that really narrows it down. Vivica realizes Mr. Smith has her miracle wrinkle removing cream that is supposed to save her company and is trying to secretly sell it to David Lang. Scene changed to Vivica trying to get a hold of her lawyer, but he's not home right now. I do not pay my lawyers to play squash! She shoves a file back into the cabinet, and we are now overlooking the ocean and some beach houses. A man arrives home, whistling with his mail, and walks over to his microscope, which I suppose he left on all day, because if I remember right, microscopes need power in order to shine light from below to see what is on the slide. Then he hears a small noise. Hey, wait a minute. Is that Martin Sheen? Holy apocalypse, now it is! He was born in 1940 in Dayton, Ohio. At this point, Martin Sheen wasn't a superstar yet, but he will be very soon. His resume is very full, and yes, as with every actor, I'm probably going to end up leaving a reference out that you are going to tell me I forgot, but I have to leave stuff out to keep the video moving. Keep in mind, though, I do really appreciate when you share references I did not include, because that must mean it's pretty good and I should check it out if I didn't already know about it. You will find Martin Sheen in the films The Subject Was Roses, Badlands, Apocalypse Now, Gettysburg, The Departed, and the TV series The West Wing, and Grace and Frankie. You, uh, I don't know, want to take a walk with me? What for? Oh, I got some stuff to say. Guess I'm kind of lucky that way. Most people don't have anything on their minds, do they? Boy, I can't wait to see how his character, Carl Lessing, plays out in this episode of Columbo. I wonder who he's going to kill. Probably whoever made that little noise in his house a moment ago. He notices someone has been looking through his cupboards and all over his house, searching for something. Then he remembers a particular something that better not be gone as he rushes to the kitchen and opens the flower tin. So that's where it was. How did you get in here? You still keep it in the flower pot. I like that he has multiple uses for both his flower pot and his flower pot. Vivica asks what he is going to do with that jar of formula, and Carl asks, don't you know? Someone who mixed up the ingredients, falsified the formula, stole it, and is now going to sell it to the highest bidder. Yeah, something like that, I guess. Vivica says she won't have it and stomps over to the phone to call the chief of police. This is Vivica Scott. I'm a personal friend of the chief's. I want to be put through to him right away. Yes, I'll wait. You still like those uh, tequila cocktails with the organic cactus juice, right? While Vivica remains on hold, Carl brings her the organic cactus juice cocktail and taunts her by asking if the police are closed tonight for inventory. You slimy little snake. Oh no, Vivi. I'm your hairy little teddy bear. Remember me? So Vivica changes the subject and asks what he wants for the jar. You can have the jar. It isn't worth very much without the formula. Where is it? It's not written down anywhere. You stole it. Prove it. Vivica tries a sympathy tactic, talking sadly about how her company's sales are down and they've lost some exclusive outlets as well as David Lang closing in on her. She needs a miracle. Carl says to make him an offer. Vivica grabs a TV magazine to write on, and boy, look at the messy greeking on that ad. What the prop guy was trying to cover up before heading home for the day is an ad for Parliament cigarettes with a recessed filter. It works like a cigarette holder works. She scribbles down some dollar figures and shows Carl with a proud look on her face. I never knew you had a sense of humor. Well, he shut her down quick there. And this has got to be a wig. Her hair is so big and unmoving. I don't know why they give so much time and focus on this magazine writing because it literally looks like scribbles with some dollar signs. Before she shows him the next offer, she includes the fact that if he is called the inventor, he'll get 10% royalties. Without even looking at the second offer she wrote down, Carl tells her it's not nearly enough for a miracle. Vivica gets impatient and angrily asks, what do you want? Carl stares at her unblinkingly. You want me? 
And Vivica's like, oh, well, no problem. You can have me. Here, I'll get closer. Then Carl gets up and walks away from her as she persists in asking for the formula. Carl then asks what else she'll offer him, and now Vivica's really getting fed up, asking, what do you mean, what else? Now, that's no way to speak to your new partner. Partner? Never in a million years! He says, well, it's either that or you go work for David Lang. So what do you say? Vivica's response looks like it is terribly painful for her to say with a smile. Partner, you have no idea how long I've waited for this moment. And now, no thank you, darling. You're not going to make a sucker out of me like you did Murchison. Her reaction to Carl's rejection and humiliation is to grab the nearest thing and whack him in the back of the head. Strangely, even though we briefly saw the slide Carl looked at earlier, which means this microscope was plugged in and powered on with a light, when Vivica picks it up, there is no power cord. But anyway, she gets scared and realizes what she's done as she looks down at her hand with glass and blood on her fingers. She shakily starts wiping her fingerprints off the microscope and the telephone, but forgot she searched his house earlier, so her fingerprints should really be speckled throughout the whole place. She grabs the jar, hears a sound, and hustles out the back door. Next morning, we see Columbo walking up the hill, taking a hard-boiled egg from his pocket and cracking it open on the mailbox. Morning, Lieutenant. Would you like to see the corpse? I like how casually he asks that. It's like, morning, Lieutenant. Want to see my record collection? Uh, no thanks, no. Columbo walks into the house and is given the rundown by a sergeant. The kid looked through the window, Dad. We spotted the body right here. Just after daylight. Look at this outline of Carl's body. Man, Vivica hit his head so hard that it switched places with his shoulder. The sergeant says Carl was a chemist working for Beauty Mark Cosmetics. They found his bank book and a magazine with dollar amounts written on the back. Columbo shows that he is listening by asking, What is that, a microscope? You know, I haven't seen one of these things since high school. And there's a blood stain. The doc seems to think this will match up as a murder weapon. However, I haven't found any prints. This fingerprint technician is played by Mark Hannibal, born 1931 in St. Louis, Missouri. He was in a few episodes of Adam 12. Columbo stands up and tells them to be careful. Feels like there's some broken glass on the floor. Anyway, Lieutenant, it's all in here. He died my fractured skull. Columbo excuses himself to go to the kitchen, searching for salt for his egg. Yeah, here's salt. It's just flour. Maybe once, not now. Something else was in there. Eight-sided bottom. Octagonal. Yeah, it looks that way. It looks octagonal. I can't figure out how that jar would leave a mark like this. The flour is so perfectly dusted around the bottom, and it's clean and shiny where it was sitting. How? Then we see a dartboard with Vivica's face on it. Carl did not like her at all, did he? We haven't really checked on who that is yet. You don't know? She is beauty mark. Every time I go to the bathroom, there she is. On the lotion, on the cream. The sergeant is played by John Finnegan, born 1926 in New York City, New York. We have already met him on the construction site in Blueprint for Murder, and then later as one of the garbage guys in The Most Dangerous Match. Then another policeman comes in. The kid's boss is outside. The cop is played by David Toma, born 1933 in Newark, New Jersey. It's so interesting he shows up real quick in this episode, as he was an active narcotics detective in Newark until 1977. There is even a TV series called Toma based on his life from 1973 to 74 that he would make a cameo in eight times. The man outside to talk to the detectives is a travel agent man that Carl placed reservations and plane tickets with yesterday. But when he wanted to confirm all reservations with Carl, he couldn't get a hold of him by phone. I sent the boy over here to snoop while I started canceling reservations. These are tickets to where? Paris, uh, George Sank, uh, then a week on the Riviera, all deluxe accommodations. This travel agency man, I think you could say, is a returning character from the most crucial game. Remember him? The credits for this episode name him Burton for some reason, and he is played by Richard Stahl, born 1932 in Detroit, Michigan. Then we learn that Carl only had $300 in his bank account. Burton, the travel agent, says Carl Lessing was supposed to arrive in his office early this morning with a check for more than $3,000. Sergeant figures the doodling on the back of the magazine might suggest money coming in. Columbo has another look at the writing on the back of the magazine. It's a funny kind of pencil to doodle with. Scene change to Vivica arriving to her beauty mark business in a 1970 Cadillac DeVille convertible and entering a photo shoot. All right, Adele, enjoy it. 
This is her enjoying it face. Columbo wanders into the photo shoot, and the photographer is immediately annoyed. Can I help you, sir? I guess I came in the wrong door. Sorry. The photographer is named Ferdy and is played by Gino Conforti, born 1932 in Chicago, Illinois. He was in a few episodes of That Girl, Mary Hartman, Mary Hartman, Three's Company, and Galaxy High School. Do you see what I see? What do we have hidden in the fog back there? That same wooden statue that first showed up in Murder by the Book in Ken and Jim's office, and then we find it again at Bo's house in Blueprint for Murder. That must have been a real popular statue to have in the 70s. Then Columbo realizes Vivica Scott is sitting over there. Miss Scott, right? Yes. Do I know you? You don't know me, ma'am, but I sure know you. Every time I shave, they, uh, my name's Lieutenant Columbo. I'm from the LAPD. Columbo lets Vivica know that Carl Lessing has been murdered since he was an employee of her company. What'd you say his name was? Lessing? Oh, not that nice young man in Dr. Murchison's department. Poor boy. Columbo says he was on another floor and nobody would let him in anywhere. Like Fort Knox around here. I'm sure about everyone knows what Fort Knox is, but I'll say a sentence about it anyway because I want to. Fort Knox is the fortified vault building in Fort Knox, Kentucky, holding most of the United States gold reserves, so they say. And saying something is like Fort Knox is clearly a metaphor for safety and tight security. Boy, it sounds like a bank vault. Huh? Fort Knox is featured in the film Goldfinger. Remember who was in that movie? You can turn off the charm. I'm immune. Then Columbo tells Vivica that it feels like he has known her for a hundred years. I feel you're like a member of the fame. I mean, you're like, uh, like Lydia E. Pinkham. Lydia E. Pinkham was an American inventor from the 1800s who is known for creating an herbal alcoholic woman's tonic for menstrual and menopausal problems. The reason it became so incredibly popular, and her name is still kind of exists today, is because she had some intense marketing for her product despite medical experts saying it was a quack remedy. Just a few of the claims she promoted her product with were that it would encourage reproduction and restore a woman's pep so that she may prove to be a better wife and mother and would deliver relief from menstrual cramps and menopausal hot flashes and ailments. By the early 1900s, her tonic was in most household medicine cabinets. So, now that we know that, it seems kind of strange Columbo would compare her to Lydia E. Pinkham, but... I think he more is referring to the fact that every woman's medicine cabinet had Lydia's tonic, and now there are also Beauty Mark products in there. Oh, well. Thank you. Vivica says he can talk to her personnel director to learn more about Mr. Lessing if you'd like, but Columbo says he's already spoken to him and he showed him Mr. Lessing's file. But there was something funny about it. It was the only file folder in the whole cabinet that had been shoved in backwards. Oh, I don't understand. Oh, I'm sure don't mean anything. But of course, Columbo is sure it means something because he goes on to casually mention that personnel files are confidential and the files are usually locked up. So he was curious who might have a key. I have one and uh, probably a dozen other people. I could get your list if you like. No, that won't be necessary. He won't bother her anymore and then starts to walk away as Vivica picks up the floating phone to let employees know he is here. But then Columbo suddenly returns with another thing he needs to bring up. There is something maybe I ought to tell you right now because it might not have been a murderer. I think it was a woman that killed him. That's sort of a strange sentence saying it might not have been a murderer, but was a woman. Because the word murderer isn't specific to men. A murderer is just a person who kills another person. I suppose he was suggesting it wasn't a murderer, but a murderess, which is, of course, specific to a woman. Anyway, the reason he says that is because he mentions the TV magazine with black numbers and dollar signs written on the back with a black eyebrow pencil. I spotted it right away because that's what my wife always uses when she makes out a grocery list. When she goes into her purse, that's the only kind of pencil she can ever find. That's probably because she is always giving the regular pencils to Columbo. Gee, you don't have a pencil, do you? (laughs) Thanks. You know, my wife, she gives me one every morning, and uh, I just can't seem to hold on to it. Vivica says Columbo's wasting his time talking to a redhead about black eyebrow pencils because only brunettes use black eyebrow pencils. The scene fades into Columbo questioning a janitor about Carl. You know if he had any girlfriends? 
Now, how would I know if he had any girlfriends? The janitor says Carl had a lot of ambition and then says something that I could use a little help from all of you to understand. I guess he figured if you can't bed the mother hen, why waste time with the chickens? I think that means why bother with the little things when you could go for the big one. The janitor is listed in the credits as lab attendant Doug, and he is played by Bruce Kirby, born 1925 in New York City, New York. He was in the films The Muppet Movie, Stand By Me, and Throw Mama From The Train, as well as several episodes of Car 54, Where Are You?, Shannon, L.A. Law, and eight future episodes of Columbo. Ain't you done any chances, brother? Yes, sir. Shame what happened to him. Bible says in the midst of life we are in death. Producer Benton hired John Finnegan, Bruce Kirby, and Fred Draper for this episode to keep Peter Falk happy because they are all good friends of his. Did you notice we're back in that stitching crime operating room and the strange shaky scrapings intro to the episode? What was that project Mr. Lessing was working on anyway? Who knows? They never tell anybody anything. They're just our nibs and a few top executives. There's that word again, nibs, that we first learned from Mike in Etude in Black. That's gotta be his nibs again. He says whatever it was they were working on, it didn't work because everyone in this section got fired. I think it's funny the one tool they decided to hang on this janitor cart is a toilet brush. Then Columbo asks about the jars in the trash. Uh, you gonna throw this out? He says yes, of course he's throwing them out, but first explains that every test product has a special container for coating. Cool camera framing with the furnace fire, by the way. You mind if I keep this? Sort of nice, you keep things in it. Kind of like the bottom. What do you call that, octagonal? I like that our special octagonal shape is just hot glued on the bottom. Oh look, a floating ashtray. Oh, Miss Scott, your phone's been ringing and I ringing. I know, Dora, never mind. I don't want to be bothered yet. Don't let anyone in to see me for a little while. Scott! Columbo always shows up at the perfect times. He tells Vivica how shocked he is with the Beauty Mark products. In the third floor, they don't do anything up there but cook up perfume for men. Am I right? Right. What's the world coming to? I ask that question every day. Vivica makes the typical mistake of telling Columbo he can come back to visit any time. Columbo looks at the picture of Vivica on the wall and says he's seen that picture every day for the past 12 years. And then he has a question about it because she always has a beauty mark in her pictures. Only this morning you don't have it on. It's just one of those things I never do before lunchtime, darling. Columbo wants to know how she puts it on. I mean, do you stick them on or do you paint them on or uh, don't worry about it, I'll ask somebody else. Oh no, Lieutenant, I don't mind telling you. I use an eyebrow pencil of course a black one then she tries to act all natural and innocent as she shuts the door to her office and then she scuttles along the floor to her desk it looks like a snowman decorated her office and this deadly looking piece of modern art was at the elevator too sitting at her desk she takes out the miracle cream and smells it i wonder what it smells like maybe wrinkles she rubs some between her fingers and is just intensely satisfied by the experience then she locks it away in her safe she picks up the phone and uses her Man Who Shot Liberty Valance voice. Hello, I'd like to speak with Miss Shirley Blaine. Um, I'll call back. Thank you. And now her finger itches. Next, we see a phone ringing and Columbo answers. Hello. Shirley walks in the room and Columbo explains the phone was ringing every few minutes, so he went ahead and answered it. Shirley asks what she can do for Columbo as she takes out a cigarette. Columbo offers to light it for her and then asks if all the cigarettes in the ashtray are hers. Yes. Why did Columbo put his cigar in the ashtray backwards? Whenever I see a pretty young girl like you doing all that smoking, I say to myself, why does she take the chance? Thank you. She must get that a lot. As she takes the ashtray away to dump all her cigarette butts, Columbo stops her because he needs his cigar. While Columbo introduces himself, he comments on the newspaper article on her desk. Isn't that a shame? Good looking young guy like that. Let's have a little look at this newspaper, shall we? Of course, our main headline, Young Scientist Murdered, Carl Lessing Found Slain in His Home. Police Searching for Assailant. Then we have, She's Third Brightest But Hard Gal to See. Board Waves Hearing for Two University Teachers. I wonder what they did. Exciting Cosmic Reach. President proposes plan to extend space launch. The current president in 73 was Richard Nixon. Traffic safety plan outlined by city road authorities. Firemen praised for heroic deeds at annual dinner. 
State backs tax resale in Creek County. Well, these headlines aren't very interesting, but I did want to share that the paragraphs are repeated again and again. Now, I know the poor prop guy who made this paper never would have thought there would be some overly observant person nitpicking at his awesome newspaper, but here we are. Anyway, Columbo's here to see David Lang. Sorry, Lieutenant. Carl Lessing. I never heard of the man. Here is a much clearer example of repeated paragraphs. On the left is all our in this for disputes further and was the of the from without. <laughs> On the right is future plans will have great bearings as it now stands. Well, I never met him either as far as I can remember. Now, why would I? Columbo says he was a chemist at Beauty Mark, and David Lang says Vivica is one of his oldest and dearest friends. It's possible he may have run into this Carl Lessing sometime or another. See this little statue? Do you remember the big version that Beth hid the spare key behind in Lady in Waiting? There are a lot of statues in this episode. This one looks like it's in pain. There are literally thousands of chemists in cosmetics. Now, why you should come here and question me about some unknown, I, I just don't understand. Mm-hmm. Yeah, mm. I got a paint on. Um. Columbo eventually finds in his pocket a phone record showing that Carl Lessing has called David Lang's private number here in the office. So, we have some confirmation here that there are phone records from Carl's phone. Now, here's a question. Why is no one talking about the fact that Vivica used Carl Lessing's phone to call the chief of police and gave her name about 30 seconds before killing Lessing? This is Vivica Scott. I'm a personal friend of the chief's. I want to be put through to him right away. Then David Lang takes out his reading glasses to take a closer look at Carl's photo. Vincent Price makes David Lang a very convincing actor because we know he and Carl met up only a few days ago to discuss the wrinkle-removing cream, Shirley told us. But the way David Lang acts is extremely believable that he simply does not recall ever meeting Carl Lessing. So he summons Shirley, and Columbo mentions Carl was expecting some money coming in very soon, but David tells him to slow down because he hasn't offered anyone a job for months. He then asks Shirley to have a look at the picture of Carl and asks if she remembers seeing him. Doesn't look familiar. Lessing? I'm very sorry, sir, but you see, I'm so busy, I don't have time to notice everyone who comes into the office. Sorry I couldn't be of more help. Columbo walks out of the elevator itching his hand as an instrument that I would love your help identifying plays. That wind-up toy sound. We hear it throughout the episode and I can't find any answers with my attempts to describe the sound in the Google search bar. Abrupt scene change to... Ten dollar raise. Did you ever hear of anything so insufferably male? No, a $10 raise is probably the most male thing I've ever heard. I don't know what she's complaining about, though. $10 in 1973 is worth almost $70 today. It certainly can't be per hour, though. That's a whole lot of money per hour. Is it an extra $10 a day? Or week? I don't know. Either way, that's a lot of money, in my opinion. Well, Shirley and Vivica are here trying to act natural in this fancy thrift shop talking about if David Lang killed Carl. You think that Mr. Lang killed him? No way. I saw that picture in the newspaper first when Mr. Lang came in and noticed it. I thought for a moment he was going to faint. Oh, dear, may I see that? I'm sure it's not your size anyway. Well, that was weird, Vivica. The only thing that dress would fit is a table. We can't stay here all day. Shirley continues and says David Lang then went to the bank and deposited that $200,000 check back into his bank account. $450. I wonder if I could afford that. Wait a minute, Shirley. Are we blackmailing here? Surely you can't be serious. If Mr. Lang didn't kill that nice young man, then who do you suppose did? Uh-oh. They said he was killed in his office. He couldn't have actually been killed in an office because he was somewhere else. How much? $15,000. And tomorrow you release that statement to the press. Otherwise, I'm afraid I'll, I'll have to show her all this. You really would, wouldn't you? I would. I don't like being a secret mistress. Do we have to go into the same arguments again? Well, it's a marvelous choice you've given me. Divorce my wife or you'll make a scandal out of our love affair. You'll tell it? Yes, right, so what choice do I have? All right. Your concern about a certain umbrella hasn't been mentioned to a single soul. But I do hope that certain other umbrellas have been properly disposed of in the river. After you. Get in there! 
Shirley, dear, why don't you come out to the farm this afternoon? There's something I want to talk to you about. Three o'clock? Good. Shirley Blaine is played by Sean Barbara Allen, born 1946 in Reading, Pennsylvania. She was in the film You'll Like My Mother and a few episodes of Gunsmoke and Ironside. Everything's fine. Oh, great. Now, if you'll excuse me, it's, it's a bit chilly. Uh, listen, as, as long as I'm here, do you mind if I just maybe stop in and say hello to... Uh... Then Shirley longingly looks at this pajama top that is certainly not $450, but maybe $4.50. Listen. There's that wind-up toy sound again. Vivica is taking out a cigarette to modify. I don't know what she is lacing it with, but it must be some serious business. Then she hears a car horn honking outside as Columbo drives through a whole bunch of red jumpsuit-wearing people. Where are we? Oh look, it's Diane Travis again from Etude in Black and Requiem for a Falling Star. Columbo gets out of his car and we hear a man counting to four again and again. Columbo looks embarrassed for the people. This looks like some kind of prison. All Columbo can do is shake his head looking at this group. He looks down at his hand and itches it again. I wonder what's wrong. Then Vivica comes outside and yells to Columbo. Lieutenant! What on earth are you doing here? Say, what kind of place is this anyway? When they said you were up on your farm, I thought, well, maybe you're Don't raising tell avocados. Don't me you've never heard of a fat farm. Columbo's so funny. Raising avocados. I thought, well, maybe you're Don't raising avocados. Never... Oh, this is a fat farm. So this is a place where people come to reduce. Vivica says they have a whole program, including hair and beauty, but the emphasis is on reducing, which is a new way to say losing weight to me. This would be a terrific thing for my wife to see. You know, she's got a little problem in that well, area. Well, we'll put her on the list. It's only $200 a day. I think we ought to forget about that waiting list. Columbus says he met David Lang today. He had some very nice things to say about you. I can imagine. Columbo keeps following Vivica, but Vivica needs to leave because it's almost 3 o'clock and that is when she is meeting up with Shirley. And here's Shirley on the beach, looking like she's never smoked a cigarette before. Vivica figures maybe she can show him some naked people and he'll go away. I certainly don't want to interfere with anything. Nude sunbathing, Lieutenant. Columbo quickly gets out of here. He does not want to look at the naked people. Vivica tells Columbo where he can find a Dr. Murchison since he wanted to talk to him. As Columbo leaves, she glances at her watch and it's going on 3.15, so she better get going. Shirley and Vivica finally meet up. Listen, love, we can't talk now anyway. Oh, oh, let me get it, let me get it. Goodness. Um. Uh, be a little more discreet with that, Vera. Uh, try again. Oh, let me get it, let me get it. Goodness. Um. Oh, that was good. Shirley just looks up and off into the distance as Vivica stuffs her purse back together. I wouldn't be near as passive. But it looks like all she keeps her purse for is to contain a load of tissues, a lighter, some makeup, and her precious Valiant King cigarettes. Vivica hands Shirley her purse while holding back the cigarettes. Check out Vivica's shoes. Going for that subtle two-faced look. Or maybe she just saw that Tom Hanks movie, The Man with One Red Shoe. As they walk away, Vivica drops Shirley's cigarettes on the ground. Then the scene cuts to Columbo finding Dr. Murchison getting weirdly massaged and yelling. Ah, whoever you are, come liberate me. Pretty much every scene with Murchison is a little awkward and weird. I'm a policeman and I'm here to see a Dr. Murchison. Murchison finally stops yelling about being massaged so roughly and tells the ladies to leave. Oh, you're a naughty boy. And you drink too much. Yes. Thank you, honey. Yeah. I think these massage ladies are trying to have a German accent, but I'm not totally sure. But the one flapping your hands on Murchison's back is played by Anne Ramsey, born 1929 in Omaha, Nebraska. She was in the films The Sporting Club, starring opposite her husband, The Goonies, Deadly Friend, and one of my favorites, Throw Mama from the Train. Who the hell are you? I'm Owen's friend. Owen doesn't have a friend. That's because he's shy. No, he's not. He's fat and he's stupid. Get out of my house. Where is Owen? Owen went bowling. Columbo introduces himself, and Murchison has ants in the pants the whole time he sits here. Poor kid. Well, as a matter of fact, I am looking at the murder, but I wanted to ask you something, man. You know, I'm surprised to find you here. I thought that she was angry at you. Murchison rambles on about his love for Vivica, as he does in every scene he's in. Because she knows I'll always love her. The goddess of beauty, sir, never changes. That's why she is what she is. And Columbo realizes this conversation isn't going to go anywhere. I suppose now is as good of a time as ever to talk about this location. We're at the Casablanca Pool House, located in Carpinteria, California. I'm sure you Californians will let me know if I pronounce that correctly. 
But anyway, it was built in the 1920s by an overly rich playboy named Albert Keep Isham. This place was a magnet for Hollywood stars and wild parties. The pool area seems to be the only untouched portion of the grounds, and that is because it has been submitted as a historical landmark. The rest of the property was divided into seven pieces and converted into seven home sites. Back to Vivica and Shirley on the beach. Shirley is frustratedly looking through her purse. What are you looking for? Did you lose something? Oh, my cigarettes. I must have dropped them. Oh, no, wait. Then Vivica very happily offers Shirley a cigarette. Thanks. I didn't even know that you smoked. There's a lot we have to learn about each other. Whew. Tastes terrible. I'm not surprised with the amount of cigarettes you smoke. I have never been able to figure out why she says that. I mean, I understand why the cigarette tastes terrible because it's poisoned, but I don't understand why Vivica says she's not surprised with the amount Shirley smokes. I'd love to hear your input on that, too. Well, Vivica promises Shirley a brand new office on the top floor right next to hers. Thank you, Vivica. So, Sean Barbara Allen's character was written to be rather odd with some uncomfortable tendencies. The kiss on the cheek was written in, but the Voldemort hug was improvised by Sean. I won't ever tell anybody anything. That's right, you won't, Vivica thinks, as she looks at her with disgust. Shirley drives off the beach, and Vivica throws down her I'm pretending to smoke cigarette, walking back to her fatty farm office, but surprise, Columbo's here waiting for her. Oh, couldn't you find uh, Murchison? Oh, yes, ma'am, I found him, but uh, I guess he doesn't know very much or he can't remember very much one or the other. That's for sure. Columbo says he'd really like to talk to her. Do you have a moment? Go on. <clears throat> mm. Throat. This is the third time Columbo coughs or clears his throat and says, throat. Oh yeah, that. Uh, <clears throat> mm. Throat. <clears throat> mm. Excuse me. Throat. Well, Columbo tries to get a little questioning in, but Vivica is reaching her limits. You don't mind if I just tag along, do you? No. Uh, I'm sorry, I really am. But you've taken up enough of my day. Well, next here comes Shirley in her 1971 Plymouth Cricket. These cars are exceptionally rare in the United States. They were only sold from 1971 to 1973 and were meant to be a more reasonably priced little vehicle. But it sounds like this car was another example of you get what you pay for. Shirley is just smoking away on the Vivica cigarette and looking high as a kite. Scene again changes to Vivica's incredible encouragement skills to help these women lose weight. Remember your goal. Now come on. Harder. Come on. That's the girl. That's it, Mary. Pay attention now. Then she notices Columbo is still here. Um, Charlie, um, uh, pick up the tempo a little. I'll be right back. Charlie is played by Ed Fury, born 1928 in Long Island, New York. He was in The Seven Revenges and a whole bunch of poorly rated movies, as well as in the background of an upcoming Columbo episode. You really are a very stubborn man, aren't you, Lieutenant? Scott, are you aware that Carl Essing had a photograph of yours which he put in his dartboard and which he used as a target? A what? Columbo tells her not to get excited because a lot of people want to throw darts at their bosses. He even shares a fantasy that he has about a captain of detectives that he didn't get along with. I always had my hands around his throat. He his belong throat. in a museum. Why at that particular moment does she say he belongs in a museum? I have so many questions during this episode. Well, she stomps away with her itchy fingers and Columbo slowly follows her. Back to Shirley, feeling the effects of that dirty old poisoned cigarette. Her vision has gone blurry and she's feeling faint and we're led to believe she has crashed. Back to evil annoyed Vivica doing her daily routine of walking on the treadmill in high heels. Columbo asks if Vivica has ever been to Carl's house. She says, don't be ridiculous. He goes on to say a young guy like Lessing probably had girlfriends that he had given a key to and wondered why one of them would be interested in one of those little red jars. Three, four. A what? One of those red jars. You know, the kind that you use in your last research projects? Hey, look what's in the background. One of those Walton roller massagers that we found in Double Shock. He says there's no doubt that's what was in Lessing's flower tin with the eight-sided bottom. Look, I don't want to interfere with your exercise and you go back and do what you're doing. Then Columbo says what he really wants to do is clear up some gossip he's been hearing. He compliments Vivica's beauty and 
says when a handsome single young man comes to work for you. And you heard that I might have dated him a couple of times, is that it? Do you know how long ago that was? That was two years ago, and there have been hundreds since then. I like young men, Lieutenant, lots of them. Boy, she's not kidding. Hundreds of other young men since two years ago? At minimum, that would be a hundred a year, so that would be a new young fella every three to four days. And if that shocks your ancient masculine double standard, I'm sorry. Well, I'm shocked. I'm not sure what ancient category she would put me in, but most likely it'd, I'd be getting belittled for having traditional female values. Sorry, ma'am, I didn't mean to upset you. I better run along. As Columbo pretends to leave, he turns around to ask Vivica one more question. You wouldn't know what poison ivy looks like, would you? I mean, when you get it? I'm afraid I don't. Well, you just like the devil. Columbo says he's got a nephew out at UCLA who is a resident dermatologist, and he says it sounds like poison ivy. And it must be uh, poison ivy. Oh, yeah. And then he says, but Sergeant Keister, German guy, his hobby is horticulture. You know plants? Well, he says there is no poison ivy in Southern California because there isn't enough moisture. Then maybe it isn't poison ivy. Columbo continues this extra drawn out story by saying he went to UCLA to show his nephew and he confirmed that it is poison ivy. Vivica finally just says, Lieutenant, I did not kill Carl Lessing. I couldn't kill a fly. Here's a little trivia that about everyone likes to bring up, that Vivica saying she couldn't kill a fly is a direct reference to the final line in Psycho, which she is in, of Mother saying she wouldn't even hurt a fly. Anyway, Columbo finally leaves as Vivica glances down at her itchy fingers. Jackson Gillis had originally written this scene to take place with Vivica riding a horse while Columbo hustles along next to her. I'm not sure why she would be on a horse at all, though. The awkward walking on the treadmill and heels scene makes way more sense. I've been using the word awkward a lot. I need a different word to describe all the awkwardness in this episode. How about discomfiture? Scene change to Vivica arriving back to her office, and probably the best acting in the episode, Dora the secretary, tries to warn Vivica of something. I just couldn't stop him. The cleaning girl had the door open. It's all right, Dora. Gotta throw somebody under the bus, and I can't identify this girl. Columbo compliments Vivica's office, saying it's very impressive. Vivica asks what she can do for him, and Columbo says he wanted to apologize for upsetting her yesterday. Then he asks if she has seen the paper. Having a glance at this newspaper, there is a repeated article about the praised fireman at the annual dinner, and again, repeated paragraphs copied from the Carl Lessing paper. Columbo asks if he knew her, since she was David Lang's secretary. Vivica says they met for the first time just the other day. She was with David Lang at a fashion show. Columbo mentions that the doctor says Shirley's eyes were sort of dilated. Well, what does that mean? Could be drugs. Quick acting poison. I found out that they actually use poisons when they make cosmetics. Belladonna, aconite. Apparently, way back in the day, like the Renaissance period, Belladonna was used to dilate women's pupils on purpose to make their eyes look bigger, which was considered more beautiful. Belladonna, or maybe I should say Belladonna, means beautiful woman in Italian. I couldn't find, though, how aconite was used for beauty in the past. It is definitely a poisonous plant and used to be used in animal bait or on arrows when hunting wolves, which is why aconite also became known as wolfsbane. Maybe you can enlighten me on why Columba mentioned aconite. Vivica says they don't use those in cosmetics anymore. Not anymore. Hmm. Then Columbo mentions they found a copy of an enormous check from David Lang to a guy named Harry Smith. And the bank says that Lang drew the check the morning before Lessing was murdered and put it back in his account the afternoon after he was murdered. Well, what does David say? What does the clam say? His closet is rather full of snakes. Vivica mentions David Lang was once a chemist himself, but he certainly wouldn't do anything as horrible as murder. He was. He was a chemist. Well, that might be very helpful to me. I'm going to get out of your hair, Miss Scott. I see you have other things to do. Then we hear the door open and close, figuring Columbo has finally left. Say, I was going to tell you something funny. Didn't that look awful? But I tell you, it sure stops the itching. Columbo's hand is just covered with some kind of itching relief powder. He says his nephew just got the report back and confirmed that he does indeed have poison ivy. He wonders where in the world he got it, since there isn't any in California, except maybe in one place. Lessing's place. Hard to believe. Columbo takes out some pictures that were taken at the crime scene and shows Vivica a picture of Carl's chalkboard. But you know what that means? Not poison ivy. Exactly. That's the extract of poison ivy. That's called urushio. 
This does seem to be the correct chemical formula for Urushiol. Columbo says there must have been a jar or something that he touched, and there is a whole crew of guys combing the place to find where that poison ivy is. Then Columbo checks the time and suddenly is in a hurry to leave. Okay. When Columbo is gone, Vivica takes off her glove and looks at her itchy finger, suddenly wondering if the cream she got from Carl contains poison ivy and is worried about it but has to be sure, so she goes to find Dr. Murchison, who is still in the pool area all by himself on an exercise bike for some reason. I wasn't going to bother you with this for a while, but I'm curious about something and I just have to know the answer. I love you, what else? <sighs> Murchison is staying consistent with his display of discomfiture. Vivica asks him if he will analyze something for her right away, and of course he will because he's obsessed with the woman. She then goes into an office of some sort to put a little of the cream in a test tube for Murchison to analyze when she hears a car horn outside. As she looks outside, there are two police cruisers parking in the middle of the area. Where are the normal parking spots at this place? Vivica looks at the jar, not exactly sure if she should hide it or maybe destroy it. She looks out the window at the rocky shore, looks at the jar, and reluctantly throws it outside where it shatters and washes into the ocean. She goes to answer the knock at the door. Sorry to disturb you, ma'am, but I have a court order here to search these premises. This is outrageous. Who's responsible for this? Columbo enters the room with a huge bag in hand. He first showed up with a bag in prescription murder and again in the most crucial game. Damnedest case I've ever seen. Really? Columbo confirms there was poison ivy at Lessing's place. I know at Lessing's, but where? It was in the bottom drawer of a file cabinet. The drawer was locked. Columbo says he never opened that drawer, so he was still wondering where he got his poison ivy. Poor thing. Still worried about your itch. You worried about yours? No. Columbo says he noticed she has been scratching her hand and wearing gloves and asks if she's been out of the state recently. No. Neither have I. Vivica tries to argue, saying he doesn't know if she has poison ivy, and Columbo responds, well, the doctor will answer that. She then says, even if she did have it, it has nothing to do with Carl Lessing, because she never touched that vial. You're under arrest for murder. Whoa. I like it when Columbo sometimes blurts out, you're under arrest for murder. That line isn't usually included during the gotcha, because it's just implied. Columbo asks the other officers to step out for a moment. He goes over to the bag and takes out the microscope Vivica used to kill Carl. He then takes a very long time to get to the point. He starts with asking if she has ever had the feeling when she's about to go on a trip that she's forgotten something. Like, just before you get in the cab, you get anxious because you feel like you forgot something. That something is missing. That is the feeling he had when he first saw the microscope. He felt like something was missing when he looked at the microscope. Well, we know the power cord is missing, but we won't talk about that. Run into George, to my brother-in-law, just back from Mexico today. Oh, brother-in-law George from Requiem for a Falling Star? Hello, George. George knows Columbo loves family pictures, so he handed him some to look at. Handed them to me, and he said, these are the best slides I've ever taken. Slides. Slides. That's when it hit me. Where there's a microscope, there's always a slide. Maybe I am misremembering science class, but I thought you weren't supposed to leave a slide on the microscope when you're not using it. Columbo tells Vivica that they got their poison ivy from the same place. They both touched the slide. You touched it when you picked up the microscope and hit him. That's when the slide broke. I got it when I put my hand on the floor and it touched a piece of glass. Very good, Lieutenant. Then Vivica calls for the officer to come and get her. Officer? Give your brother-in-law a message for me. Something appropriate. The end. I really quick want to know why does it seem like the second murder never really matters to Columbo in the takedown of the villain? Lily Lysenka's murder was eventually forgotten about, Tracy's death was mentioned in a passing, Quincy's death was just a fact, but the death that was investigated was Uncle David Buckner's, Tanner the butler was just deemed a suicide even though Columbo was skeptical, Harry Alexander was also just mentioned in passing, and Lisa Chambers was completely forgotten about. That is every second murder so far, and now Shirley Blaine's death is just like, what a shame, so young. Anyway, it just really seems like that second murder should also be regarded as extremely important, and not just a strange coincidence to the first murder. It should help cement the catching of that evil villain. Anyway. I'm going to rate this episode, and then I guess I have a whole bunch of more stuff to say. So I knew what I was going to rate this episode before I started working on it, and my rating did not change after working on it. 
I give Lovely But Lethal three Colombo cigars out of five. This is my second three cigar rating, the first being Dagger of the Mind. And if I'm going to be completely honest with you, I'd rather watch Dagger of the Mind. <laughs> Hook, line, and sinker. <laughs> I think the only thing really interesting about this episode was the fact that Vincent Price and Martin Sheen were in it. I think about anyone who is familiar with Vincent Price feels a bit gypped by how little he appeared on the screen. But apparently, there were a few more scenes with him that were cut, of all things. There was a short scene where he gives his secretary, Shirley, the $10 raise for covering for him in front of Columbo, confirming that Carl Lessing was not here to visit him. Another scene cut, we actually hear it approaching. After Vivica kills Carl and wipes away fingerprints, listen. Guess who is coming to the door? It is David Lang about to knock on the door with the $200,000 check for the miracle cream. But what we get are two scenes with Vincent Price that could have been played by anybody. Here's a nice little quote from Vincent Price about being on Columbo. I loved the show, so I was very pleased to be asked to be on it. The only reason Lovely But Lethal was chosen as season 3's opening episode is for the Vincent Price name to encourage viewers to tune in. And that is still the case today. If you look up Lovely But Lethal, what do you see? Vincent Price. And then you'll see Martin Sheen. And then you might see Vera Miles. <laughs> this episode has the 1960s Little Shop of Horror syndrome, where all you see is Jack Nicholson's face when you look it up, even though he was just a small cameo. It's because of this episode seeing both Vincent Price and Martin Sheen in basically cameo roles rather than murderous roles that made me start thinking about other stars that would have made a very interesting murderer for Columbo to catch. Keeping the parameters of the individual being alive and active during the 70s, here are a few names that came to my mind. Elvis Presley, Robert Mitchum, Jack Nicholson, Toshiro Mifune, Boris Karloff, Kirk Douglas, Al Pacino, Robert De Niro, Christopher Walken, Dennis Hopper, David Tomlinson, Sean Connery, William Defoe, Betty Davis, Orson Welles, Jimmy Stewart, Desi Arnaz, and Fred McMurray. And you know, I would love to hear anyone else you think would be a blast to watch trying to outwit the great Columbo. We'll have to do this list again when we enter the 90s era of Columbo episodes. Yes, I do plan to go there. Martin Sheen agreed to accept this small role for two reasons. One was, he really liked Richard Levinson and William Link, the creators of Columbo. Here is a quote from Martin Sheen when asked about Levinson and Link. They're just such good and decent and bright and funny guys. I laugh around them all the time. They're very humane. I would work for them wherever, whatever. The second reason was that he just really wanted to meet Vincent Price. Another quote, Even though I knew I had no scenes with him, I knew I'd get to meet him. That was my thrill. He's one of my favorite actors. We had great fun together. That's my favorite memory of that whole show. Mine too, Martin Sheen. Originally, Columbo was written to be as infatuated with Vivica as he was with Nora Chandler, but it just didn't flow that way. Every time I shave, they, uh, it's a pleasure. I feel you're like a member of the fame. I mean, you're like, uh, like Lydia Pinkham. Gee, I've seen this picture every day for 12 years. You're a beautiful woman. At any rate, uh... Vera played Vivica much colder than what was written, which led Peter Falk to play Columbo less distracted by her beauty and more just constantly hinting at things that makes her stare at him wide-eyed with worry. There is even a line cut after Vivica gives up from the gotcha where Columbo says, So I guess you know how badly I feel, Miss Scott. You've been like one of the family for so many years. Giving off that same kind of vibe as Columbo telling Nora Chandler he's been in love with her all his life. I guess everyone does a good job acting in this episode, though, but I also find these well-acted roles to be pretty bland overall. It seems to me maybe the deepest character might have been Carl Lessing. He's got a pretty heavy grudge against Vivica from two years ago. He remembers her favorite drink. He brings up the weird pet name of Harry Little Teddy Bear, but pet names are often kind of weird. He doesn't give in to the, I would think, pretty good deal with Vivica in Beauty Mark that he extorts out of her and instead throws it back in her face as a chance to humiliate her and make her feel as useless to him as she made him feel to her. And the case resolution centers on the fact that the murderer has a rash from poison ivy, and that since there is no poison ivy in Southern California, she only could have gotten it from the victim's home. 
While it is true that poison ivy is not found there as the climate is too dry, poison oak is very common in Southern California and could easily have been the source of the rash. This discrepancy was not addressed and Columba would not have had probable cause to arrest her if it was brought up. Also, I haven't forgotten, Vera Miles stood five foot three inches, which surprises me because she looks tall. But she is always wearing big platform heels and has a huge wig on. And I noticed that our horror theme that was supposed to take over the whole episode really only stuck with the intro. And once again, Columbo never lit his cigar in this episode. And finally, the working title for this episode was Beauty Is As Beauty Dies. That's an interesting one, but I think I prefer Lovely But Lethal. France titled this episode Adorable But Dangerous. And Finland titled it Death and the World of Beauty. Please share if your country had a different title for this episode because I have so much fun reading them. And coming up next is Any Old Port in a Storm.